Hello folks and welcome to Captain Crazy's Cassette Lab. I don't know why I am the way I am, but I am what I am, so that's all that I am. Anyway, today we're finally looking at the very top of the line of the JVC cassette deck experiment here. This is a TDV 931. Fresh off the boat from Japan. Well, not fresh. I've had this for like three or four months now. The idea behind this year was I'll buy two extremely high-end top-of-the-line tape decks and see how they fare. And the first one of those was the A&D GXZ 9100, which is still at the top of my cassette deck rankings, uh, in my collection that is. I don't have access to Tanberg and Revox money yet, so uh, that's what I've got. But uh, yeah, there are people who claim that these are... Uh, Nakamichi level dragon killers, but I don't know about that. I'll probably never know about that because I have no intention of paying what people ask for dragons. It's just not going to happen. I'd get one if I could find one under a grand, but uh, that's that's what it would take for me to get one. I just don't want to spend two thousand, three thousand, four thousand bucks on a cassette deck. It just doesn't make any sense in two thousand twenty-four. I love these things, don't get me wrong, but uh, yeah, this is 2024. Cassettes have been a, have had their day and they've come and gone and uh, I'm just here to have fun and uh, revisit my childhood, as it were, by playing with all the tape decks I couldn't get access to when I was broke. So uh, yeah, we're going to find out what this one's all about today, I hope. It needs a fair bit, but uh, hopefully not too much. Again, like the uh, TCK666ES, I'll be a little more reactive than proactive with this unit. I don't think it needs very much, but uh, yeah, it's going to get whatever it needs today, I hope. And uh, I didn't buy pinch rollers for this, so uh, hopefully I can get it going. But uh, I've got my supplies all here and ready. I've got the FRSP 8.97 for a new belt. This is to drive the uh, slave cap stand in there. And I do have one pinch roller. This is an 11 millimeter from Fix Your Audio. I don't think I've got the one for the uh, supply side. I think that's a 10 millimeter. Could be wrong, but uh, I didn't have specifications on pinch rollers to go by when I bought this thing. So uh, yeah, I have to make do with what I have. And I'd like to save the ones that are in there because they've got proper centered bronze bushings in there. So uh, yeah. We're going to service this a little bit different than I service most pinch rollers. And I've also got these today. A pair of new gears for the, uh, for the fast wind system and the uh, cam actuation. Or the uh, control actuation. Sorry. Even though this deck doesn't need them, I've got them. And I've actually got another set of them in my... Uh, uh, parts deck over there. My TDX501 actually uses this same transport. It's just set up a little different because it's auto reverse in that unit. But I've got another gear in there, or actually another set of gears in there, and they're both good. I've checked, and I've got two idlers in that particular transport as well, in case this one needs one. But uh, yeah, we got to get going on this. You will remember in my uh, nine debt diagnosis video that this is playing way too fast and that's because the capacitors have gone out on the uh, capstan motorboard in there those have to be done immediately that's why i'm not waiting until october for this thing well i guess it's almost october now but yeah we got to start getting into this it's got runaway capstan so i'm going to flip on my 100 volt transformer there i'm not even going to try to put this thing onto a the 125 volt grid here it's just too expensive i remember when i got this thing the seller wanted something like 900 bucks buy it now for this thing but he also had a uh, opening bid set at 560 so i thought well i'll try the 560 i'll see if i get it and sure enough i got it that was the only bid i put in on this tape deck <laughs> but uh i think i got a fair price this seems to be what most of them go for these days. So we'll power up. I can already hear the capstan motor running away. We have to get this door off in order to uh, get into it. And we're going to 
try doing some basic tests here with a tape in it. I want to see how well the transport works. Get you a nice and close like. Okay. Play works fairly well. Fast forward. Play. Rewind. Fast forward. And it seems like the transport's in great shape. And uh, that seems to track with my observations on this unit. It is reading audio, but uh, there's no point playing it because uh, it's running fast. But uh, yeah, there was minimal build up on the cap stands and on the heads, so I'm hoping I got one in really nice shape because if I didn't, the money I spent on this is going to make me angry. Anyway, I might as well show you the uh, pinch rollers real quick before we get in there. And yeah, you can see it right there. That has an actual sintered bronze bushing in it. So I'm going to be cleaning those up if I can and uh, reusing them. If I can't, well, we'll see what we, what we got to do. I think I can get a supply side pinch roller out of the uh, TDX 501 transport. I think it uses the same size. But uh, on this side, I think I got to use the uh, Fix Your Audio pinch roller. But uh, yeah. Shut her off now, because we got to get in there immediately and fix up that uh, capstan motorboard. One second while I put this tape away. I got the cover screws out so you don't have to wait for that. And good lord, what an impressive, impressively built tape deck this is. The Japanese just went nuts in the late 80s and early 90s building extra special tape decks, it seems like. Anyhow, we've got some uh, things to deal with here. Just looking at what I need to do to get inside this. And it looks like we've got four screws. Two on each side. And I have no idea if this has ever been serviced before. It may have been. How come I can't get my screwdriver to bite on the uh, screw? Just so I can free these wires up. Okay, this cable goes down to, uh, looks like the headphone board. So we don't need to disconnect that one. But we do need to uh, get way down there release that connector down there right there and uh, we gotta pull this one off too right here should be able to just remove the transport now and we're gonna be have to or we're gonna have to be very careful with the uh, vacuum fluorescent display that they uh, attached to the top of this thing and I've got another connector to to remove so I'll set that back down gently so I can do that. And now we can get a look at this. Oh, interesting. They've got this weird little canted plate here. I don't know why they've got it like that, but uh, I'm showing the camera in case I have to put it back like that later. I don't know if I actually have to get in there or not, but we'll see. Interesting the way they've got this put together. Big plastic front piece and then the transport is just bolted in there. And I've done some research. There's an audio blog from Japan where I guess it's a technician or a company that services these regularly. And I've been looking at some of those to see how this is put together. And uh, I'm finding that very helpful now because I think it's going to 
be interesting to get in to get the uh, transport out of this thing okay now according to that blog we have to take this uh, whole board off and i'm a little nervous about that because uh we have to watch that we don't destroy this vacuum fluorescent display and why jvc decided to do this and put a vacuum fluorescent display right above the uh, tape transport i don't know i'm not overly fond of that decision though but uh, this has to come off in order to uh, get the transport out of the carrier If I'm understanding the blog right. I cannot wait to hear how this sounds. I really hope the heads are good. Because there are no donors for these heads, I don't think, unless I buy another one of these. I don't think even the TDV 1010 has these same heads. Oh, lovely. It's our favorites. The easy fail buttons. Okay, now also according to the blog, we have to desolder this right here. This is for the uh, electroluminescent panel to uh, light up the uh, cassette well. So uh, let me fire the iron up and I will do that. And while we do this, I'll just tell you that uh, I got the DD99 to work well enough to give me wow and flutter readings, and uh, the result was extremely impressive. Even without servicing, using my uh, Technics RSV755 test tape, that thing immediately gave me 0.029% wow and flutter without service or anything. So I'm starting to believe the claims that that thing can actually do 0.016% wound flutter or something crazy like that because uh, yeah, it was already telling me that the RSV755 was running in spec. Calm down, self. It's only an $800 tape deck. You only gave up your mountain adventure vacations this year for, for this thing. Man, I miss the mountains. But maybe I'll miss them less once I get this thing up and running. The audio blog didn't say anything about these screws. But they clearly need to be removed. There's one on each side. It seems like it's loose. And yes, that is the deal. Set that up out of the way and then we'll take our first look at the uh, 931's transport. And just for giggles, I'm gonna get the one from the TDX 501 as well, just so we can compare what the auto reverse version looks like and there it is very similar construction brakes are firmly on and I don't think I will be removing the real tables on this thing simply because I'm still a little nervous around uh, JBC's real table uh, construction. They've got little felt clutches inside these things. And that's the same deal over here. But on here, there is uh, no back tension other than uh, the spring that's inside the uh, real tables, I do believe. <clears throat> and on this one, the back tension is provided by, uh, uh, let me zoom you in here so you can see it. The back tension brake on the 931 is this guy right here, and that's what I'm most interested in looking at right now because uh, that'll tell us how much wear this transport has on it. And I'm going to say not much wear at all because uh, that doesn't really look like it's worn very much. I might have a decent example of a TDV 931 here, but. Uh, 
go back out again. You can see that this idler here is the same as what's on over here. And these two idler, idlers are in perfect shape. So if this one needs replacing, I got two right there. But uh, yeah, I'll be interested to see how those gears are holding up after all this time. And I'm taking a look at the pinch rollers now. Well, at least one pinch roller. Seems to be quite grippy, so I think I can refurbish those. But I can also measure them now too, at least diameter. 10.4, 10.3. 10.2 and this one is nine millimeter. <laughs> oh, great. Let me get the uh, Fix Your Audio one out that I prepared for this. I just wanna make sure it's gonna work at least on the supply side. 10.7, yeah, that'll work. If I need it, I may not need it. So yeah, I think if I bought pinch rollers for this, I would go 10 mil or 11 millimeters on this side and 10 on this side. And I, I'm gonna have to uh, run the, uh, the path checker tape through this just to make sure it's not uh, mishandling the tape in order for me to uh, be confident enough to uh, put my torque tape in this thing. So yeah, we may or may not get a torque reading out of this thing today. But uh, we'll be able to tell from the wow and flutter results whether or not it's working properly because this one is supposed to be like 0.021% or something crazy. Okay, let's get in real close and take a look. Max magnification. That's the playhead. A little bit of corrosion on there, but it looks good. That may wear off with just normal use. I'm not terribly concerned about that level of corrosion. We had far worse than that on the neck BX, or not the BX150, the uh, 480. Okay, let's go over to the record head. That is looking good. Not too much pitting at all. I may give this head a swipe with the auto saw just to get the corrosion off the playback head, but uh, I'm actually not even sure I want to do that. This head looks great. Okay, put that off to the side and we will start getting into the uh, capstan motor because it needs the, the most help with that right now. And fair warning, I have already looked at the, uh, the one capacitor that's visible from up here and it looks like it's bad in this one. <laughs> it looks real bad. So what do I got to do to take this uh, plate off? One, two, three, four screws. Okay, we've got a bracket that came off. Set that off to the side, and these are gonna be adjustments for the thrust bearings. I'm not gonna to touch those. Just checking the uh, yeah, they're fine. We don't need to touch those. Thrust bearings are okay. All right. We're about to find out just how bad this board is. Oh, it's not good. <laughs> Look at that. That is some bad corrosion. It's all screwed up down through here. I'm going to jumper across that with some component leads, I think, and uh, obviously this capacitor has been leaking like crazy. So, yeah. Got my work to cut out for me on this one, and this other one has been leaking too, you can see it. 
there's uh, corrosion on three of the pins of the IC. But uh, fortunately, it doesn't look like any of the corrosion actually got into the IC. So, uh, yeah, those three pins right there. I need to clean those up big time. And uh, obviously, the capacitors have to go. Okay, so I'm ready with new capacitors. I was hoping to use these little guys. These are uh, Panasonic FC, I do believe. And they're tiny, but uh, unfortunately, these are like 4 ohms ESR now. So uh, I'm not sure about that. So I'm going to have to try and go in with the, these. These are Nichicon PY. They've got half the ESR of the uh, Panasonic capacitors, but they're also like twice the size. So I hope they work. I think they will. It does appear that there's enough room in here to, uh, to run them. So yeah, we got to get started with this because these capacitors have to go yesterday. I was checking them with my uh, new tweezer doohickeys here and uh, I can't get a reading off either one of these. They're that bad. So let's jump to her. Got to use the cutoff method. Get my iron out. Blob some fresh solder on it so we can get through the uh, corroded solder. And that's basically how I do that. Yeah, that trace might actually be totally gone now. And there's another damaged trace right below it. So I'm going to have to check on that and install jumpers as needed. Yeah, I'm going to have to solder right to that pin on the IC because it's toast. And I don't know if the other two pins do anything, but uh, I'm sure I'll be finding out the hard way. Because I can't get access to the other side of the board at all. Well, folks, I think and I hope I got this working now, or I got this fixed now. Had to go over this side like half a dozen times in order to get it cleaned up in order to uh, repair all the solder joints. And even in, at that, uh, the leg of the IC here was uh, completely corroded away down by the solder pad. So I've just, yeah, I went ahead and just soldered the capacitor directly to the IC. So. That should be good now. And uh, this this land was fine, so I reused it. Over here, there was so much electrolyte trapped in under the solder mask here that uh, I basically had to scrape away a new solder land over here and clean it like 12 times in order to get anything to stick to it. But it, it's sticking now. And uh, just to make sure I have all my bases covered, I've installed a jumper wire here back to the IC. It's supposed to be there, don't worry. You can see the uh, actual solder trace that comes down to that IC. And then on this side, I just kept the, so kept the capacitor lead and soldered directly to this capacitor and this resistor. So uh, that should be fine now. So uh, we can continue with this little endeavor and start working on the uh, cap stands and such. But yeah, I've never seen corrosion and uh, leaky electrolyte be that bad before. <laughs> so uh, this had to have been drifting off speed for quite some time, if you ask me. But uh, I will clean up some thrust bearings now. Because that's going to get new grease. feel pretty tight so I'm happy with that and now we got to uh, bring the transport around so we can deal with belts I'm gonna take this belt off just for measuring it's still quite grippy it could still be reused maybe if I boiled it or something but I've got a new one so we're gonna get a get a new one in there I'm going to set this back in place 
for now because I want to check on these uh, oil keeper washers on the other side and uh, remove them. Okay, now we'll set the motor plate back off to the side again. Put my calipers out of the way. We got to be careful of any washers that might be under here. There's a thick washer under here. So I'm going to extract that for now and I'm going to place it right next to uh, that flywheel. Oh, that's right, I forgot. Something very important. These JVC units have this little thing under there. So, uh, I'm going to try to gently set this down. We're going to pull off this idler. So I can extract the little doohickey that dries the idler. Oh, almost lost that washer. It's real tiny and real hard and real easy to lose. Okay, we'll set that idler on top of that little washer. And yes, we're gonna have to extract this uh, this little uh, plastic dew jangler that drives the idler. Actually, maybe I'll leave it in. Well, no, I have to extract it because I'm going to use acetone to clean the bearing. Oh, I see the problem. It's trying to uh, come through with the bearing. So I have to get some tweezers out in order to, to extract this. Oh, there it goes. It's moving now, finally. No worries, I've got replacements for these if I need them. Okay, there we go. That's off. And do you see any washers? I don't see any washers. And here's our little idler driver thinger. And while I've got her in this position, I might as well run through the uh, capstan bearings with the, uh, the acetone. Let me pull this spring off first. Or no, wait, it wants to stay there, so let's leave it there. Now you gotta watch it with these pipe cleaners because they will leave debris in the capstan bearing if you're not careful, so just check that after you use them to clean out capstans. You don't want them to be stuck in there, do ya? And anytime you see me uh, using these pipe cleaners, I've already done that after the fact. And this is why I go straight through them. I don't uh, go in and out. I would rather have it pull any excess fibers to the top of this uh, side so I can get, them, get to them again. And then I immediately throw the pipe cleaner away. I don't risk getting fibers inside these bearings. Or I don't like to risk it anyway. Okay, that's two. Now you can't see what I'm doing, but I'm going to uh, use my flashlight and I'm gonna look from behind and see if all the fibers are out. It's time to clean some uh, flywheels and such. Get my hands full of acetone while I'm at it. There does not seem to be an excess amount of debris on this flywheel. Yep, got a screw stuck to that. It's not good. You gotta watch it around this magnetic stuff, because uh, Component leads will stick to this and you won't see them and uh, they create problems that way. Almost had that problem happen with the 666ES. And 
and based on my little observations with that little uh, plastic knurled thing, I can tell you that the uh, rear bushings on this don't go th through very far on this, so uh, yeah. That's why it's good that I got that uh, thing out with the tweezers. One more drop back here. I don't think it needs too much more than I put in there. I'm trying to be mindful of that uh, vacuum fluorescent display there. The whole time I'm doing this, and it's not so easy, but uh, yeah, here's the front bearings. Here and here. Very, very nice. I will forego a third drop in front. In my experience, two is usually more than enough, and uh, after three, you start getting oil where you don't want it. So I'm being a little more cautious about that. Okay, so we'll take our... And there's another washer in here if you can see it. I'm gonna leave that one there, but uh, this one goes back in and it's gonna get some grease on it. Just a very, very light coating. Basically trying to apply some where the uh, spring goes. Okay, that one's moving well. Now there's really not much to uh, to do on this one, except make sure all the magnetic stuff is off the uh, the magnets here. And it looks like it is, but uh, remind you, or I have to remind you that we got to put this back in too. So, got to get my tweezers and kind of. get it in place all right feels good to me and now that that's in we can put the um, motor board back on theoretically then we can move around to the front side of the transport that is entirely too much molly coat I gotta say Just need enough to do the job. We don't need to glob it on there like some kind of a molly coat loving weirdo. Now the big test, will my new capacitors fit? Oh wait, it would be good if we put a belt in there first, wouldn't it? Just trying to get it centered right now. All right, I'm happy with that. All right, before I tighten that down, I want to check my clearances. Oh yeah, plenty of room for that capacitor and the other one. I can see they're clearing the whole assembly perfectly fine. So I'll snug those down just a little bit and we can move on to the front side of the transport. I hope this motor works because uh, the amount of surgery I had to do to, to deal with the, uh, the nightmare electrolyte in there is considerable. I'm just trying to get this uh, one wire out of the way because we're going to have these uh, two motors out. And it's currently blocking the uh, access to them. Okay, front side of the transport. 
I might as well clean some uh, capstans while I'm here. I'm wiping them off with a dry Q-tip right now, and I'll go in with a uh, isopropyl one in a second. Don't have to worry about them anymore. Now the idler. Let's take a look at that real quick. And let's lose the little washer that goes with it. I grabbed that too quick. It's on the table somewhere. Oh, it's on my finger. Right there. Uh, you gotta watch it with these little doodads. It's a little bit hard. Let me go over to the uh, auto reverse transport and I'll see how good those are. Oh yeah, these are in better shape. So I'm going to take the one off this side of the, uh, the backup transport here, as it were. And I'll use that one. Now I've got two washers to keep track of. All right, now we're gonna clean this and I'm going to, what am I gonna do? It feels plenty grippy, so I'm going to use distilled water only. Yeah, it is kind of developing some surface cracks. Let me get my wire brush here. Basically do the same thing I'm going to be doing on the uh, Pinch rollers. Just giving the uh, surface a light scuffing to, to make it grippy again. Yes, I know I probably should have bought a new idler to go with this, but uh, I spent 800 bucks on this thing. I'm not spending any more than I have to. And when I do the pinch rollers, I'll get some soap and water. instead of distilled water. And I just realized I have to clean off the surface of the uh, the plastic thing in there that drives this idler because uh, there's oil on it. I'm glad I'm actually remembering to do stuff today because uh, that triple six ES left me so discombobulated I wasn't sure if I even wanted to start on this as my next deck. But it's been sitting here waiting patiently for me all this time, so let's make it happy. And I'm taking a look at the grease as well. I don't think it needs replacing. No, it's fine. It's graphite grease, it looks like. So that'll stay good forever. At least I hope it will. But uh, yeah, we need to... Uh, Reinstall idler. There we go. That's the result I was looking for. Basically putting a little bit on to block the hole, and then I'll push it down on the shaft, and the shaft will chase the, uh, the grease through. Like so. Okay, so break time is over, and I'm getting ready to do pinch rollers next. And I'm reason I'm doing pinch rollers next is because if I change out those gears next, then, uh, well, I have to manipulate this once the pinch roller is back on, at least on this side, in order to uh, get it into a play position. And I'd rather do that on an old broken up gear than uh, risk damaging my new one. So uh, that's why I'm doing that. Now I'll tell you right now, I'm a little nervous about this. Reason being, this is a plastic nut here, so I don't want to use the acetone on that to uh, release the uh, the paint lock on that. So uh, I'm not sure if I'm going to get away with this without breaking it today. But uh, hopefully the, uh, the metal nuts I got for the Pioneer deck will work on this one too if I need them. Because uh, the Auto Reverse deck has a completely different pinch roller setup than this one. They're clipped in on that model. This one has to be adjustable, so uh, on both sides there, well, this side has a uh, clip, and then this side has the nut, so let's deal with this first, if we can, 
use my teeny tiny adjustable wrench here. I'll try to break this nut, this little adjustment nut loose. Just going back and forward a couple times just to make sure. It seems like it's going. It's possible the acetone would work, but uh, yeah, I just want to be careful here. And it goes without saying that if you take this pinch roller off, you have to set it back at the right height again. So measure first if you don't have the alignment gauge that I have. Thankfully, I've got the alignment gauge, and I'm just going to try and pick some of this old uh, paint lock out of here so it's not interfering with the uh, threads or anything. I think we're okay on this one. I should be able to reuse this. And the nut appears to be fine with no signs of any cracks. That is good. And there's a, there's a double spring underneath here that we need to be concerned about. One side clips in here and then the other side goes up here. So I'm going to release that now, or at least try to. And it's probably best to do this with tweezers. Okay, spring is released and is now residing over here on this post. And off comes the uh, pinch roller. And I have to apologize, this side does not have a sintered bearing. This side is just plastic. So uh, this side will get grease, the other side will get oil. At least that would be the plan. So let me get the other pinch roller off. Same deal. It's got that same spring. I know you can't see it because I haven't twisted this around, but it's there, trust me. So I will set these down by the uh, transport just to know where they go a little better. I got my brass brush here, and I have a bucket of uh, lukewarm semi-cold water here that I will use to do this with. Just checking my shot to see if you can See what I'm doing? Yeah, there we go. So before we use that, I have to uh, get rid of the uh, the hubs. Okay, so only one side of these axle shafts are going to be uh, held in place. One side's going to be looser than the other, and that's just so you can get the axle out to uh, service these things. So. Uh, and it's usually the bottom side. Usually. That may not be the case on this one. Oh, it is the case. It's fine. We're doing fine. Okay, shaft is out. Nice long one. And we've got a spacer with a what looks like a built-in oil keeper on it. I'll show you here. See, there's a flared part of this. This goes by the pinch roller, that part. So remember that. I'm going to clean off the shaft now because I can. And because it has to be done anyway. This is really clean already, I gotta say. Either this was serviced before or it's extremely low hours, this machine. All right, now I'm gonna service the, uh, the bearing in this pinch roller the same way I do the uh, cap stands. Acetone on a pipe cleaner. And now we got to commence to uh, cleaning that up. And I'm going to start cleaning. Just 
just going to dunk it in there right now. I'm going to clean the uh, the bearing out again before this goes back in. And now we just take a wire brush and go over it. Bronze, or a brass wire brush, that is. Not bronze. What am I thinking? We're just removing the surface glaze from this pinch roller. It's actually in pretty good shape. You don't want to use sandpaper for anything like this because you'll get flat spots on the pinch roller and no es bueno. Forgot to check if there was a crown on this pinch roller. Let me halt for a second. I'll get a dental pick and uh, yeah, there is ever so slightly a crown on this. So don't take the crown off. That's the other reason you don't want to use a uh, sandpaper. If you take the crown off, it won't behave like it used to. And yeah, this takes quite some time, so uh, I'll probably go off camera here real quick and uh, just service the pinch rollers and uh, stick them back in. All right, the... Uh, take upside pinch roller has been done. It looks fantastic. Not sure if it'll perform fantastic, but we'll find out. And uh, just occurred to me I should show you the act of uh, oiling this so you can see how I do it this way. Because this is really the only time I've ever done it this way. Usually when I do pinch rollers I just replace them, but uh, And they're all 456 on this one because it's a centered bushing here. And the reason I'm doing it on a paper towel is so I can see when there's plenty of oil in there. All right, spacer, tweezer, where is tweezer? Right in front of my facer. All right. Now we just gotta tap her in. Give her a little tappy. Tap, tap, tap a -roo. A little too much. Perfect. Feels good, yo. I'm gonna install a little mully coat at the top here where the pivot is. Well, that's too much mully coat now, but whatever. Let's clip her back in. There we go. That's one pinch roller done. Clean off the excess molly coat, and now I can do the other one. But I'll do that one off camera. All right, folks, the pinch rollers are done. I'm relatively happy with how this went, but the supply side pinch roller didn't clean up quite as good as the take up side did. So, fortunately, the take up side is the important one. So, uh, <clears throat> that's that. Now I'm going to. Uh, Clean the cap stands again, because I don't want any oil on the pinch rollers I just cleaned. And we're going to have to bring the head block up so we can use the alignment gauge. Let me get set alignment gauge ready. And we shall get this done. And I can tell the uh, the gear I'm manipulating in order to raise the head block is already cracked. It needs to be replaced. Good thing we were planning on doing that, huh? Oh, this is not cooperating very well. It's oh, that gear's disintegrating as I play with it here. 
It'd be nice if I had a bench power supply to do this for me, but I don't. Otherwise, that triple six ES would be fixed by now. Just about lost all the teeth now. <laughs> Great. Keeps springing backwards is the problem here. No, it's not moving it anymore. It's too much gone. So we're going to have to make do with what we have, I think. And it would have been great if I'd put this on the dang thing before I started screwing with the gear. All right, with great difficulty, I've managed to get this thing to go into full play mode. Wasn't easy. I had to basically manipulate the other gears that are down under there that are still in good shape, but uh, I did it. So how far off am I on this guide? I'll take off my glasses so I can see this better. It's actually fairly close. All right, I think we got her. Gonna leave it for now. I wanna check the uh, the head tilt and all that good stuff. Man, I cannot see this with the uh, camera gimbal in the way. Okay, head tilt's good on the playback head, but what about the record? Because we got discretes here. Okay, that's fine too. I'll just check the guide. And we are wavy gravy on the guide, so we're fine. Now, if I can find my glasses again, I'm gonna paint lock that and we'll live happily ever after. All right, our next order of business is to deal with those broken gears and other such issues. So, this goes the same way it did for the auto reverse machine. Four screws. And I'll put them in order of how they came out, because they're like four different ones. Bet you I can't get that one out very easily. Well, if I pull the brakes out of the way, I might be able to. Yes, sir. This one's going to be tricky because it's trapped under the brakes. And we've just got one more. Okay, now we go around to the other side and we try to work that stuff out without having to uh, hopefully mess with things. And I just realized I forgot to reconnect a spring that should be reconnected now so I don't forget about it. One second, please. Oh, well, this thing wants to fall out first, so let's go ahead and take it out first. Please don't tell me I have to take the capstan motor back off in order to do this. I was hoping I was done with the uh, capstan motor, but apparently not. 
Okay, now out they come. Move that up there so we can uh, deal with this a little better. And you can see just how far gone this skier is, so definitely time to replace. It's just turned itself into Swiss cheese. Well, not Swiss cheese, maybe, but cheese, nonetheless. Yeah, it's deforming just trying to get that off. And off it comes. Now, of course, while we're here, it's always a good idea to... Uh, oil the front bearings in these things. So I'll grab the Anderol here. One little drop on the motor ought to do it, and that's not a little drop I realize, but uh, whatever. It'll be fine, trust me. I knows what I'm doing sometimes. Maybe not today, but sometimes. Now I can find my new gears. Okay, this one here is for the uh, fast wind. And this one here is the one we got to install. Over here. should do the job. Now this side is going to be a little tricky because of how this is. It's kind of raised up a little bit. So I'm going to try to find enough of these uh, feeler gauges here so I can get it back relatively where it is. All right, right there. Now, the question is, how do I get this out without uh, problems? Maybe I can just pull it. Yes, I can. Perfect. And there's our old gear right there. It's still in good shape, but we're definitely better off just replacing it. And letting it roll all over the place. I don't see any damage to the other gear, so that is good. I'm not going to service any part of this because there's a clutch in there, so it feels all right as it is. There might be a little bit of a crack up here, right there where the shaft is, but there's nothing I can do about that, really. So if I can remember how that went back in, Probably like so. Yes, that'll be the way that goes in. But first, oil. Could use the sewing machine oil for this because Anderol is a bit expensive for this kind of work, but uh, I've had that little bottle of Anderol for ages now, so not too worried about it running out. When it does run out, I'll probably switch to compressor oil for cap stands or something like that. I don't know yet, haven't really thought about it. Okay, feeler gauges. I'm gonna take one layer of feeler gauge away. I'm going to tighten this up just a bit more. Wasn't quite happy with that. Looks all right, though. Now we reinstall, and hopefully that's the end of uh, service on this machine. Oh, I got some broken teeth to clean up. My big concern with the uh, teeth are is just making sure that uh, 
those teeth don't uh, get into the new gear and break it. And there's one tooth still in there that I'm going to have to uh, try to get out here. I think I got it. Pretty sure. Yeah, I got it. Of course, we'll find out the hard way if I'm wrong. Okay, let me just check fitment here with my flashlight if I can find the cotton picking thing in front of my face. Okay, control gear is fine. And we'll check the, uh, the idler here with dental pick. It is free moving, so we're good to go here. I will put the remaining screws into the uh, capstan motor and we should be off to the races here pretty quick. All right, so we are done, I guess. I'm going to throw this back into the machine and then we'll see what happens when we try and use it for the first time after service. What did I break? We're going to find out. All right, folks, the transport is back in and we're going to see if it works. Make sure there's enough light. We're going to see if the capstan motor starts. And it sure did. Is it running the right speed? Well, we'll find that out real quick, too, because I've got audio connected. We're going to see if it'll play properly for the first time ever. And I've already cleaned the cap stands multiple times, so I'm not going to worry about doing it now. I did demagnetize the heads off camera. I always do that on three heads. Two heads, you don't need to do that because, well, two heads. The recording function does that. Oh, I forgot to... Uh, reconnect the the lamp up there. Great, I'm gonna have to do that real quick, but uh, we can test it now. Do we have proper speed? About to find out. We do, but there's something going on with the uh, with the reels in there. I noticed it was unspooling. Let me get you in there so you can see what I'm seeing. Watch this. Okay, that is not proper. Fast wind works. Why is it doing that? Is there Oil on the uh, the plastic thingy I put in there, very possible. I might have to take this all apart to deal with that. I can't see the uh, the actual idler, so you can't really tell that way. It should not be doing that. All right, so I'm gonna to have to get back in there and dig into that. All right, folks, the verdict is oil where no oil should be. Figured that was gonna be it. There's oil all over this idler now, so I'm gonna to have to clean this off and uh, put it back in. I've already cleaned back in here. Just basically, I used too much oil in the uh, front capstan bearing and it got all over the idler, that's all I can tell you. So let me clean this up and we'll check again, I guess. All right, folks, we're going to take a look at the wow and flutter in a second. I think I've got all the issues with the transport dealt with now, but uh, we need to talk about some of these things I found during testing that I have now fixed first. That idler that was in there from the auto reverse deck did not work out. I reinstalled it after it was cleaned and it was still stuttering. So we have indirectly diagnosed the problem with the auto reverse machine that caused it to uh, to uh, damage the tape in that machine. And the fact is that idler was slipping in that machine too and causing the uh, tape to lose tension and when that happened 
it was able to fold the tape in half on the pinch roller. So uh, as far as this machine goes, I have reinstalled the original idler and uh, I have gone with my uh, rebuild in a bottle thing with it. So uh, that idler is going to have to be replaced in the future. I'm not going to do it now, obviously, because I don't have one, but uh, I'll get one ordered probably with the next Fix Your Audio order and uh, I will get that swapped out. Now the other thing is a fairly major thing and uh, I'll just tell you that uh, I ran my path checker tape through this and everything was fine except for one thing. I had a lot of tape curl around the front edge of this uh, guide right here. So uh, I don't know what was going on with the alignment gauge, why it didn't get the uh, the entry guide lined up right, but obviously it didn't. And I've checked it again once I got it back apart and it was still okay according to the gauge, but uh, just in case, what I have done now is I have uh, adjusted this guide so that there's no more tape curling around either one of these guide posts over here. So, what does this mean? Well, it means one of two things. One, either this transport isn't quite compatible with the, uh, the alignment gauge I use, or B, the, uh, the uh, heads have been misadjusted from factory. So... Given what we know about this machine, in f that the fact that is that there is no service manual for, for this machine, what do you do in this case? Do you screw around with the head al alignment just to uh, get it to line up properly with this guide again? Or do we come back to this guide and adjust it to the point where the, uh, where the tape curl is no longer occurring? And that's what I did was I adjusted this guide so there's no more tape curl. It's tracking perfectly over the heads now, so uh, I'm going to leave it there. It's a little bit too far in according to my alignment gauge now, but it's going to have to work because uh, I'm not messing with these heads. These two discrete heads, I don't want to deal with that. I do have an alignment procedure I can use if I ha absolutely have to realign these, and uh, the alignment procedure is found in the service manual of the TDV 1050. So I hope it's accurate to this deck as well, but uh, it, it may not be so. Uh, yeah, I just wasn't comfortable uh, messing with the heads, so I've just adjusted this guide instead. So should be happy now, and we should be able to get a nice wow and flutter reading. There's no more tape stuttering around that uh, take up side. So I've got it powered up now. And we're going to run the RSB755 calibration tape in it, and we're going to see just where the wound flutter comes up. Very curious about this I am. Either it needs further work, or it's going to be exceptional. Let's find out. Three thousand six zero point zero four. Can't ask for much better than that. I'll remind you that the belt is brand new. It hasn't broken in yet. This might improve as time goes by. And look at this. It's already improving. Kinda. Remember, it's fighting the resonance of the uh, Technics mechanism as well. So, uh, this is already outperforming the A&D machine after I got done servicing it. So, I'm taking that and I'm working with it. So, what is the next step here? Well, the next step is easy. The next step is me aligning the azimuth off camera, because that'll have to be done now. And then I'll do a recording if it's all working, and then the next segment you'll probably see is the record playtest. Unless there's another problem, in, in which case we'll deal with it as it comes. Well, folks, we've got a further problem. The azimuth screw is stripped out. I cannot actually bring this into alignment. I can push on the head block and get the levels way up, but uh, I can't actually adjust them to stay there. So what I'm going to have to do now is I'm going to have to uh, pull the transport all the way back out. I have to take off the adjustment screw for the azimuth, and I have to, uh, I don't know, I guess add a washer or something so I can apply enough pressure to the screw that I can actually dial this in. 
So, uh, yeah, I guess we'll see what happens. And, oh, while I'm thinking about it, I have come to decide that my Hans Peter Roth Azimuth tape is actually perfect. You'll remember I had some uncertainty about this because uh, different decks just wouldn't dial in the way I thought they did on, or what, or how I thought they should on this tape, but uh, no, it's just the nature of the beast, really. Azimuth is off every time you drop a tape in the player. <laughs> That's why Nakamichi came off with, up with that auto Azimuth stuff. But uh, yeah, the Hans Peter Roth tape is fine. I have no problems with that, but uh, yeah, let me get into this and I'll see if I can fix it. All right, folks, the problem isn't the threads on the uh, adjustment screw. The, the problem is the paint lock. It hadn't released and it, the entire screw was turning inside there. I don't know what to do about that. I don't really want to remove this head lock at all. Might have to, but uh, as of right now, I have this adjustment actually working. With the uh, pressure from the spring back behind it, it is able to adjust now. So I'm going to throw it back in and hope I can get it calibrated this time. And yeah, I did put some acetone in there to dissolve the paint lock, but apparently it wasn't enough and I had to uh, use the hot air to uh, heat this dang thing up. So uh, wish me luck. Well folks, there it is. We got her. Levels are a little bit off on one channel, but I'm not too concerned about that. I can't get it looking any better, and it's off the chart, whereas before it was like half the size of this, so it's lined up. So I may try to adjust playback levels here, I don't know. So the deck is back together, and I wanted to say a couple of words about the azimuth tape before we move on to a record and play test, and hopefully it records. If it doesn't record properly, I'll have to maybe shoot another segment or do something, or I don't know. Might have to align the recording azimuth yet, but uh, I'll deal with that when and if I have to. Remember, these are discrete heads in here, so you have to align them separately. Anyhow, I put the Dolby tape in this thing and check the levels with that, and they're perfect. So, uh, whatever's going on with that slight high frequency drop off on the right channel, it may be a worn head, it may be the corrosion on the heads that are still there yet, it hasn't had enough tape run through it yet in order to scrub that off. It may also be the fact I was using a magnetic screwdriver to adjust the azimuth, so, uh, I've gone in and I've uh, done another uh, demagnetizing of the heads, so hopefully it's good. I listened to a tape on it made with a GXZ9100, which has perfect heads, and uh, it's got all the treble in the right channel that you would want, so uh, it should be okay. So I got to uh, go pick a track now, or two tracks, or three tracks, and see if I can find something to demo this with now. I'm still hoping to go Soundstripe in the near future, because uh, I'm running out of obscure Canadian CDs that I can use to demo these things with. But, uh, yeah, that's neither here nor there. We're dealing with this right now, so, uh... Yeah, let me go see what we can get out of this, and we'll see how it sounds. And, by the way, when it comes to my top five listings in the uh, description below, I don't know where this one's going to end up, if it's going to end up in the top five at all. So, uh... By the time you see this, I might have made up my mind on that, so check down in the description for uh, for any updates on that and see where this ends up. And uh, yeah, it's going to take me some time because the GXZ9100 is so bloody good that uh, this thing's got a fight for it. In for it, uh, it's just the the A and D machine is a monster. And uh, this is a monster, so uh, we'll let the two of them fight it out, and we'll see who gets my favor the most or whatnot. And yeah, this thing's across the line now, so theoretically, let's find out.
Remembered held in his hand And that river creeping up across Burkitt's land Creeping like a shadow of that man Soon the prayers of stand man There's a 
All right, folks, we're going to do one last little segment on the TDV 931 before this video goes into the pipeline for, uh, you know, posting next week as I'm shooting this segment. Finished most of this video a couple of weeks ago, and I just wanted to uh, come back to this and do one last little segment, letting you what, know what's going on with this unit and uh, what needs to be done and what will be done and so forth. Basically, what's going on is, uh, thanks to the video footage I shot previously, I now know what the issue is with that tape curl. The issue is the exit guide tape height is improper, and that's because the playback head height is improper. And I think it's always been that way. From the factory, back when it was even brand new. And uh, it's not an issue with my alignment gauge at all. That gauge is aligned to Nakamichi 480, so I know it's working, and I know it's fine. But uh, the problem is, the way I had my uh, videoing set up that day, with the uh, camera gimbal placed where it was, I couldn't exactly see the, uh, the checker bar properly when I was uh, checking the, uh, the exit guide uh, height in there. And it turns out, when I reviewed the footage, I could tell that the uh, guide height was off. So, uh, 
Basically what this means is I'm going to have to get back in there and realign the heads properly using the alignment gauge and we'll make a whole video out of that eventually. I'm not sure if it needs pinch rollers yet. I'm going to buy some just in case, but I'm going to try to keep those pinch rollers that it has now. I think they're fine. I don't think that's the problem. The entry guide height on the uh, supply side pinch roller there it is now three full turns in from where I had it with the alignment gauge, so I know how easy it is to get it back into uh, where I had it before, so uh, that's not going to be a problem. I'll use the alignment gauge again, and I'll get everything dialed in properly, and, and then this deck will be fully polished off, and oh, by the way, this is why the, uh, the levels were improper as well on the azimuth tape. It's because of the head alignment. We'll get that dialed in too. I don't think there's anything at all wrong with these heads. I think they're perfect. I think this is a low hours machine. It was very rarely used, I think. Just my impressions from this deck. Anyhow, I was anxious to see what the uh, head alignment did for the uh, sound quality of this deck, so I recorded this Vaporwave tape on it. Used one of my brand new 74-minute uh, Axia tapes, and man, I want more of these tapes. I'll tell you that right now. But, uh... Yeah, I did Cosmic Cycler's feature presentation and After the Cinema on this tape. Feature presentation doesn't have a lot of treble in it, but uh, After the Cinema does, so uh, I've listened to this entire tape on the Nakamichi 480, I thought w which was... I can't talk. Which I thought was appropriate for this, because the NAC 480 was out of alignment in a, a similar fashion as to what this is right now. And I really wanted to see how this sounded on there. And boy howdy, this sounds glorious on that deck. And the NAC 480 is in alignment. So uh, even if I left this thing as it is now, it's a beast. I can't even imagine what it's going to sound like once we get it into a full, perfect alignment. But uh, yeah, very happy with this deck. And I'm even more happy that it's giving me more material to work with than just one video. Because... Uh, 800 bucks, I mean, I'm not going to uh, get YouTube to pay this off for me in any time soon. <laughs> I'm only making like maybe 50, 60 bucks a month from YouTube right now. But uh, yeah, I'm very happy that uh, it's giving me more than just one video to go on. So uh, as for where it fits in the top five decks, well, check out the video description. It's in there. Got a few more comments on that in next week's video, which has already been shot, so remember that. There's a few more comments, sort of like this, in next week's video. But, uh, yeah, I'll let you get to that, and... Yeah, see you in the next video. Take care.